thank you all very much for joining us for the last bite Size class this festival. My name is Axel Sterry and I'm a researcher at the Yehur Center. And I'm delighted to welcome Professor Roger Crisp as our final speaker. Roger is a Yehur Fellow and his research interests are in ethics, political philosophy and ancient philosophy. And he will be speaking today on hedonism and pleasure. So Roger will, will speak for between 20 and 30 minutes, leaving 15 minutes or so at the end uh, for a discussion. And please turn your microphones off during Roger's talk. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat as we go along and we'll get back to them at the end. And please do be aware that under 18s may be taking part. And so we ask you to ensure you use appropriate and respectful language. So the floor is yours, Roger. Uh, thanks very much, Axel, uh, and thanks to all of you for, uh, for being here. It's uh, it's going to be our hottest day of the year in the UK, so it seems particularly pr appropriate to be talking about pleasure and uh, enjoyment, um, or indeed, or indeed, pain and suffering as well, depending on how you feel about high temperatures. Um, so, what I'm going to do is talk about three three major topics. Um, the first one is what pleasure is. Um, you might think it's uh, straightforward to answer that question, um, but of course, because it's philosophy, it, it, it's not. Um, but I'll try to set out the different options and you can make up your own mind. Uh, I will also tell you which uh, view I accept um, in case you're interested. Then I'll go on to talk about what people call hedonism, which is the view that pleasure is the only thing that matters. If we're talking about good things, uh, obviously hedonists also believe that pain and suffering matter, but they would be bad. So hedonism is the view that only, only good things matter. And I'll first of all talk about that view as a view about what makes life good for people, which philosophers sometimes call well-being. And then I'll go on to talk about it um, uh, as a view about morality. Um, focusing in particular on utilitarianism, which is the view that um, hedonistic utilitarianism, which is the view that we should maximise net pleasure. That, that's produced the greatest balance of pleasure over pain overall. So first, on, on to pleasure itself. The, the standard view in the history of philosophy has been that pleasure is... Uh, a property of experience. It's sometimes described as a sensation. Um, it became known as a feeling tone in some theories in the 20th century, because uh, partly because people were a bit worried about calling it a sensation, like, for example, an itch. It didn't seem to be quite as specific as that. But the general idea is that there's some uh, felt characteristic that all, all pleasures have, and this is their, their pleasantness. Now, in the 20th century, um, that became a minority position. It has been, it has been the, um, the position held by most philosophers uh, since the, the time of Socrates, because, well, for various reasons, but mainly because people thought this doesn't make sense because if you think about pleasant experiences, they're so different from one another. So if you think, for example, about enjoying a novel, uh, enjoying a cool drink on a day like uh, today in the UK, or uh, going for a run, the, the, you might enjoy all these things, but they, the, the pleasures seem very, very different from one another. So this has led most philosophers who think about this subject to deny um, the view that I just mentioned, which some people call internalism, the idea that pleasure is somehow a common property internal to all experiences. So uh, the idea is, you know, these experiences are very heterogeneous, they're very different from one another, so we need to have uh, a different theory to account for them. And what people have done is develop forms of so-called externalism about pleasure, where the idea is that pleasure 
occurs when you have an experience towards which a person takes a certain attitude external to the experience itself. And that might be, for example, that you want the experience to continue. So if you have an experience, you want it to continue, that's what a pleasure is on that version of externalism. Uh, and there are different forms of it. One immediate problem with externalism is the fact that if you say to somebody, well, you're having this experience, why do you want it to continue? They're going to say, uh, well, they might say, because it's pleasant. So we're back to where we started. But I think there's a more serious worry about externalism, which is that um, on the face of it, though pleasures are very different from one another, pleasurable experiences are very different from one another, pleasure isn't. Pleasure is the same in all these experiences. And we can compare experiences in terms of their pleasantness. So even very different experiences, like, for example, you know, imagine you're listening to a late Beethoven quartet on the one hand and drinking an ice cold Coke on the other. Maybe you're doing them both at once, right? I could say to you, which do you enjoy more? And you might say, well, it's so hot, I'm enjoying the Coke more. Or you might say, I'm enjoying the Beethoven more, but you can certainly compare the two. There doesn't seem to be uh, a problem with that. So I would, I'm with the majority on the nature of pleasure and also with um, John Locke, who said that pleasantness is, and, many, and actually many empiricist philosophers, many philosophers who've based their philosophy on experience, who've said pleasure is a basic um, fundamental quality of experience, which we all, we all know what it is, but we can't articulate it in other terms very easily. I mean, we can give other words for it, but if there were somebody who'd never experienced pleasure, you would not be able to explain to them what it's like. So that's a little bit on what pleasure is. Now let me talk about the view that pleasure is the best account of well-being. That is what's good for a person. Some people are what you might call global hedonists. So they think pleasure is the only value there is. So they wouldn't believe, for example, in aesthetic value, at least as a fundamental value. So they would say, look, what's good about all the stuff in the National Gallery hanging on the wall is that it produces pleasure when people look at it. There's nothing, there's no value there independently. If it all burnt down, it would be bad, but only because people would not be able to enjoy looking at the works of, of the works of art. This is, this is a narrower view I'm going to talk about, the view that only pleasure matters for our well-being. Uh, and of course, pain, we want to avoid pain. We, according to most hedonists, we want the largest balance of pleasure over, over pain. Now here I want to make um, an important distinction which uh, is often forgotten. And I'll have to use um, some te slightly technical terms, but the, the, the general idea is pretty straightforward. So the idea is that you, there can be substantive theories about well-being and these theories tell you which things are valuable so hedonists will say uh well there's only one thing that's pleasure but you could add other things you could say uh, oh i think friendship is valuable or knowledge or accomplishing something or me having meaning in my life i mean there are lots of things that people might add to the list but the hedonists will just have pleasure on there okay the next question is going to be um, and this, this would be to do with explanation. So this would be a, an explanatory theory. Why is this thing you've listed valuable? Okay. And I think a true hedonist will say pleasure is the only thing that's valuable. And it's valuable because it's pleasant. That's, that's the reason. That's what makes it valuable. Um, so hedonists could agree that friendship is one of the things that make your life valuable, the friendships you have. But they don't think friendship is valuable in itself. They think it's valuable just because it produces pleasure. 
Okay, that's the explanation. And in philosophy, what matters is really the explanatory theory. And hedonism is, is a very simple theory. Um, it's, I mean, it's hard to call it dominant, but it's certainly because I, it's hard to call any theory dominant. But if I had to guess, I'd say it's, it's been the most popular theory in philosophy, in Western philosophy anyway, uh, for the last you know, two and a half um, thousand years. For some reason, it dropped out of circulation pretty much in the 20th century. So there was somebody called G. E. Moore, who was a philosopher in Cambridge uh, at, the, on, at the turn of the century. And he launched a, a pretty powerful attack on hedonism. Uh, that may have had something to do with it. Um, one of the great historians of ethics, Terry Irwin, told me he thought it had something to do with the kind of Christianity uh, that one found in Western philosophy in the 19th century, where somehow it was thought inappropriate to see pleasure as valuable rather than, say, virtue. Uh, but anyway, these days, very few philosophers, I think only about 10% of the philosophers in the world who've been um, um, uh, asked a question about it say, say that they're hedonists. Most, most people think there are a load of other things like accomplishment or friendship that are good as well. And the main, the main objection to hedonism is, <laughs> is not that hedonists think pleasure is good and that it's good because it's pleasant. The main objection is all these other things are valuable as well, right? So accomplishing something with your life, for example, is valuable independently of its, of its being pleasant. And one objection which captures all of these um, types of objection has become very famous, and that's the so-called experience machine objection to hedonism, where the thought is, if you are a hedonist about well-being, you have to accept that if somebody were to plug you into a, a machine which gave you false experiences, but were experiences which were nevertheless highly pleasurable, much more pleasurable than the ones you'd, you're having in the real world, if we're in the real world, could be on a machine. Um, but if we're in the real world, then this machine would give you much more pleasure. It looks like the hedonist has to say it would be better for you if you plugged in. And um, that, that idea, as you, as you may know, has, has influenced various films like The Matrix uh, and um, others. Now, how does the hedonist respond? Well, I think the hedonist has got several things they can say, and none of these things are really knocked down, but they, they're worth taking into consideration. One of the things they can say is, look, if you look at all the things that are meant to be valuable independently of pleasure, they tend to be things people really enjoy, like friendship or accomplishing something with, with, um, with one's life. It's also the case, if you are a hedonist, other things being equal, you shouldn't go around trying to produce as much pleasure for yourself as you can the whole time, because you won't actually have the most enjoyable life if you do that. The way to, to, to do it would be to... Um, take something as a goal independent of pleasure, like, for example, ac accomplishing something and um, enjoying it as you go along. So what the hedonists will say there is that the, their opponents are confusing the true goal with some helpful uh, ways of uh, achieving it. Another thing um, he hedonists can say is if you look at the evolution of values, let's take accomplishment. What there's, there's a possibility of what some people call a debunking argument there. If you think, where did it, why, did, why do people value accomplishment? Well, most of our values probably go back to the hunter-gatherer period. And it would have been very important during that period that people accomplished certain goals. I mean, in particular, to do with hunting and gathering. And these people, if they come back to the group, would have been praised and celebrated and so on. And you can see how this, uh, this would have led to something like the views of accomplishment that we have today. So what people are doing by trying to achieve things is gain admiration, 
um, pleasure and so on. This is fine. Um, it, it is very enjoyable, as the hedonists say, but it could be that in itself it's not especially valuable, except in so far as it's enjoyable. So I'm going to end by saying a little bit about hedonism in ethics. So I've talked about the nature of pleasure. Um, I've talked about hedonism as a theory of well-being. Hedonism in ethics and utilitarianism. So utilitarianism is what some people call a moral theory. And if we go back to my distinction between um, a substantive theory and an explanatory theory, it's an explanatory theory. It says the right action is the one that produces the greatest overall sum of well-being or happiness. And the theory is a modern one. It emerged really in the 17th century. Interestingly, it, it began as a, a religious theory. It was, it was a theory put forward by theists who believed that um, God had created the world. Why had God created the world? It was because God wanted us to be happy. Well, God is rational, so God would have wanted there to be more happiness than less therefore god um, accepts utilitarianism and so should we and what's interesting about that is that by the time of the 19th century most utilitarians i suppose jeremy bentham um, in the in the 18th century actually is, is the most famous um, atheist utilitarian atheism became uh, standardly associated with utilitarianism but it doesn't have to be uh, there have been theistic utilitarians well there probably are now but there certainly have there were in the 20th century so Richard Hare who was a um, well arguably the leading act utilitarian uh, in in the UK in the middle of the 20th century was was a theist so you can see how you'll you'll get different versions of utilitarianism depending on um, what theory of well-being you 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 plug into it now one of the things about utilitarianism is that it seems very counter to common sense or the the morality that most of us are inclined to accept so if you've done any moral philosophy you'll know that people who don't like utilitarianism will come up with various counterintuitive conclusions that it leads to for example you know that um, if you're a doctor and you can, by killing somebody, you can um, uh, use their, you can, you can, you can remove their organs and then share those organs around people who need organs. You could promote happiness by doing that. So it seems to be counter to common sense. But I think this has led to a sort of misunderstanding about the relationship between utilitarianism and common sense. It's not as if you have a spectrum with sensible um, views like common sense morality at one end and then crazy utilitarianism at another. This again was a 20th century invention because people, and this, people in the 18th century were absolutely clear about this. Utilitarianism is part of common sense morality. Other things equal, you should promote more happiness than less. What's remarkable about utilitarianism it, is that it says that's the only bit of common sense morality that we should hang on to. Everything else has to be thrown out. So forget about rights, forget about equality, forget about any idea that you have to give priority to certain people like your children or your parents or your friends or uh, your partner. You've got to be completely impartial and just promote the greatest amount of um, utility. And the way utilitarians tend to respond, respond to these objections is rather similar to the way they respond to the objections about uh, hedonism, if they are hedonists. They'll say, oh, well, don't worry, because all these things that you value, like accomplishment and so on, we, we want to promote those as well. 
Um, and it's the same with utilitarians when it comes to rights or equality. They'll say, oh, don't, don't worry. We believe that doctors should accept that patients have rights and they shouldn't go around cutting them up to get their organs and so on. But that, complete, that misses the point. Uh, all, you know, all this philosophy, and there have been thousands of articles and books written on the basis of this mistake, unfortunately. Um, it, it, it misses the point because the question is not the substantive question, but the explanatory question. So if we imagine a case, for example, in which a doctor does carry out this terrible series of operations, um, the question for the utilitarian is, is that the right action or not? And they just have to say yes. They can't say, oh, don't worry, because we're going to teach doctors not to do that kind of thing. The question is, is that doctor violating patients' rights or not? According to the utilitarian, the answer is that they're not, because there are, there are no rights. And the upshot of this is that really we've, we've still got a standoff in moral philosophy as we do in the theory of well-being between I and mean, this is um this, this picture is slightly rough but it, it's it's really in the theory of well-being it's really between people who think that only pleasure matters and people who think pleasure does matter but other stuff matters as well and in moral theory between people who think all that matters is um promoting well-being impartially or producing the greatest happiness and people who they also think that as well though they don't realize it but also think that lots of other things are valuable as well like rights or equality or whatever it is so we've got this standoff um it's been going on for uh hundreds of years we're not making much progress with it and i'll end with one thought on that that unfortunately I think philosophy is quite a dogmatic discipline it always has been and human beings seem to have a tendency to believe that they've discovered the truth and nobody else has or at least people who disagree with them have got it wrong so a lot of philosophy is uh, consists of people who hold a certain view being nasty about other views criticizing them coming up with objections and i think that's fine but it should be combined with an attempt to work out why your opponents have the view that they they do have we shouldn't be thinking oh this person just dis disagrees with me so i've got to destroy their view as soon as i can by showing that it's internally inconsistent or it's got some crazy implications you should also be thinking why do they think that i mean these people are not you know they're not crazy they come to a completely different view from me i better talk to them and engage with them in a constructive way so um i thought i'd mention this because this is this is a festival of arguments um and i think obviously in philosophy we have to engage in arguments but we should do it in the right way so i'll end there